Welcome everyone. Uh, webinar on leadership and the voice to parliament. Uh, my name's Phil Usher, CEO of First Nations Foundation and uh, going to be the host for the day. Uh, before I go any further into the formalities, just want to acknowledge country. Uh, for me, that's uh, I'm down here in Nam, uh, the Wurundjeri people. I acknowledge elders uh, past, present and emerging. Uh, also for the, the panel guests, uh, we've got Ian over in Perth at the moment. Uh, acknowledge Noongar people, uh, Karen's in um, Sydney, uh, so Gadigal people, the Eora Nation. Uh, Narelle's in Orange, uh, my my people out there, uh, where Andrew Way and Kyle, where I live, um, are Wobbycool people as well, and, and extend that to uh, everyone else that's in the room. So the purpose uh, of this session um, is is really to be uh, a good, robust discussion with information around the voice to Parliament. We're not particularly focused on trying to persuade uh, one way or the other. I find that uh, the goal of this is just to give people the information. So when it comes to time where we go to the polling booths and we're making our decision, that people can do it with the right information from uh, trusted sources and can make the decision then if everyone does research get some good education gets some information and, and still decides to vote no on the voice to parliament uh, at least it's done with you know the right information at hand uh, be nothing worse than uh, having some of the the information in the no campaign come out and, and really influence people's decisions when uh, it's prob probably not the real intent so the way that uh, we'll, we'll work uh, with the webinar, I've got a few uh, questions that I'll, I have to get things going uh, and I'll bring the panel members into um, different conversations. And then uh, depending how that conversation pans out, we'll flip to a, a Q&A for, for people at the end. But it's really designed for, I guess, navigating that leadership conversation um, around the voice, I find that there's a bit of hesitancy uh, in the space. I, I do a bit of advisory work, particularly in the super and finance sector. And while staff members seem quite keen to, to move forward on organisations taking a stance on the voice, when we get to that executive or board level, um, people are just a little unsure as to uh, whether they should come out vocally and support it and um, you know what might happen if they um, you know do that or is it better being silent? And that's some of the questions that we're gonna go through on the panel today. So I'm just going to quickly go through and introduce uh, each of the panel members uh, before kicking off with some of the questions. So uh, we've got Ian Ham uh, as a Yorta Yorta man, uh, extensive uh, uh, work history uh, with a lot of work and boards. He's a chair of Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, uh, our chair here at First Nations Foundation. I uh, probably won't go through all of them because it'll take almost the full hour, but also <laughs> president of the Community Broadcasting Foundation and a director at the Healing Foundation. Welcome, Ian. Uh, we've got Narelle Hooper, Editor-in-Chief of the Australian Institute of Company Directors Magazine, uh, who I have to say are doing a phenomenal job um, showcasing uh, Indigenous stories and, um, you know, First Nations people in that governance space. Uh, probably a real leader um, from what I've seen in terms of uh, getting those stories out and, and probably um, giving them sort of the respect that they deserve in the, in the coverage and um, the attention across mainstream Australia. Uh, also a, a Director at the Ethics Centre, and previously at the ABC, Fairfax Media, SBS, and former editor of Australian Financial Review's Boss Magazine. Uh, thank you for joining us, Narelle. We have Kyle Lodes, who's current chair of Active Super, uh, non-executive director of AMA Group, Great Southern Bank, chair of Hunter Medical Research Institute, and conjoint professor of practice at Newcastle Business School at the University of Newcastle former chair of NRMA and another one that's got a very extensive background and I'll kind of uh, close it there to give you an idea of his uh, experience in governance. Uh, thanks for joining us Kyle. And we've got Karen Mundine, a uh, proud Bundjalung woman and CEO of Reconciliation Australia, bringing more than 20 years experience leading community engagement in public advocacy. Uh, some of the key events that she's been involved in is the Apology of the Stolen Generations, Centenary Federation uh, Commemorations and Corroboree 2000, as well as the 1997 Reconciliation Convention. Uh, thank you, Karen, for jumping on with us also. So I think the first place uh, I want to start with is, I'll start with Ian, and it's probably just setting the tone with a bit of a, a definition. So we all kind of have, uh, you know, an understanding and, and we're on the same page from the get go. Uh, Ian, can you give us a, just a brief de definition of around those three components of the proposed referendum being, you know, the constitutional recognition, the voice and, and the Macarada Commission? Yep, I can. Thanks for that, Phil. It's a pleasure to join everyone today. And I pay my respects to the Noongar people on whose country I am today. So 
really, I guess, in, in summary, and I'll do this short so, you know, there's lots of time for discussion. The three parts that are around the uh, uh, the proposals or the or what we're looking to advance in the Aboriginal discussion at the moment, for want of a better term, is so I'll, I'll start with the uh, the Makarata Commission, which is, I guess, has a twofold role. First of all, it's a bit of a truth telling commission. So for those of you who might be familiar with South Africa, they had their Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and in Victoria, my own state, we have our own Uruk uh, Commission, which is again, a bit of a, well, a bit of a, it's a truth telling exercise as well. But the Uruk Commission and the Makarata Commission also have an additional workload as well. And that is to not only record the history, if you like, fill the fill in the blank pages of the Australian story, in this case from Makarata Commission, but also help us navigate the way forward. There's no point investigating where you have been if you don't then let that think about what do we need to do to go forward to the future. So in that sense, it's also not just recording what's happened, but as I said, the Makarata Commission about looking at where we're going into the future. The voice, uh, that's a clearly obvious one, I think. That in and, in and of itself is is but a part of a bigger picture. I mean, there is the Uluru Statement and things that come out of that, Makarata being one of them. But the voice is a very fundamental one. Phil, I just want to go to the first one you said first. What was that? There was the Makarata, the voice, and... Uh, just a constitutional recognition. Constitutional recognition. Okay, I'll deal with that first before I come to the voice. So constitutional recognition in and of itself, if you look at that as a standalone thing falls a little bit into the Durfred category for me. It's it's pretty obvious. I mean, it's, it is simply recognising uh, something which is fact, that there was a civilization made up of many nations which has existed and a functioning society which had evolved over time and had many shapes and forms here for the totality of human occupation, which at a conservative estimate is estimated to be around 60,000 plus years. It would be it would be remiss of the Australian constitution to not be amended to recognise that, to have that in it. Personally, I think it should probably, the Australian constitution could do with a decent rewrite full stop, mm -hmm. but it probably needs to be at a place of prominence if you just did that. Something which in the constitution that says, uh, well, to put it in the punter's language, black fellas were here first and they're still here. Pretty simple, that's recognition. But beyond just having that, do we have extra meaning? And this is where the voice comes in. Um, so I suppose uh, what the voice does is add something to that recognition. But having said that, it's something which is really not a big ask. If you think about what the voice is, it is simply allowing the, the uh, civilization and the people who are the continuance of that civilization, I won't say the descendants of, because we're still here. Descendant implies something stopped and hasn't been continuing so we're not the descendants of that civilization we are that civilization doing what we've always done is adapt to the environment in which we find ourselves and all the voice does is give if you like an extension of that recognition to say uh, that civilization should be given the opportunity to speak about itself should be afforded a mechanism to be able to speak that's all that this is about. So if you like, there's those three components. The Makarata, which is about helping us tell the story of who we are as a country, but helping us chart forward. Recognition, which is really uh, just stating the bleeding obvious. There is a continuing civilizer. There has always been a civilization here. It continues here and is part of what we call the Australian nation now. It didn't stop and is separate too. It's part of us. Uh, and the voice component is allowing those people who are that continuing civilization to be able to talk to talk about ourselves okay so we, we we're acknowledging we've got that truth part of the the makarata says that first nations people here we had our own economy as a way of living mm. acknowledge that in the constitution and then having that opportunity to to provide our voice um mm. to parliament what what's what sort of your advice <laughs> it's funny how this happens in indigenous affairs when people see Indigenous people in media who are opposed to the voice and then they think that somehow represents the majority of, of other Aboriginal people or it kind of dilutes the mm. uh, people supporting it. How do you navigate mm. that as someone, you know, just the average punter um, trying to engage with this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, there seems to be this notion that all Aboriginal people have to agree, uh, which, is a, which is a quaint one. I find it a quaint one, not a very effective one. 
because uh, last time I checked, democracy doesn't mean you all have to be in absolute agreement. Uh, that kind of comes with stuff like North Korea, and I don't think that's a shining a light of, you know, <laughs> universal agreement. Um, that thing about people saying, well, what if they're Aboriginal people have a difference of opinion? Well, absolutely, we have differences of opinion. In fact, it would be abnormal if we didn't have differences of opinion. Um, and in fact, in fact, I would be concerned if we did universally agree. When I, I, I find when everybody's in enormous agreement on everything, I always get a little bit suspicious because clearly I'm missing something that everybody else gets, <laughs> or they're not telling me something because something's going wrong. That's how I approach when everybody's in universal in agreement. I think it is right that there are people who've got who won't support it, who have a different view. They have a right to do that, and I will defend their right to do that, even if I don't agree with it. Um, or as I once said, I will defend their right to be wrong, and I will absolutely do that. This notion that we should all agree before we make any progress on Aboriginal affairs is is uh, an anathema, to say the least. I also look at, well, why do other people not have to agree? Because without being, you know, putting too fine a point on it, has anybody checked the mixed bag of lollies that make up our federal parliament at the moment? I mean, gosh, <laughs> nobody will, could all say they came from the same jar of boiled sweets. They are all over the shop, from the sublime to the ridiculous, you know. So, And yet somehow our parliament functions and so does our country. Why can't Aboriginal people have those differences of opinion um, and say it's okay to have a difference of opinion? So I think that's how I deal with it, Phil, is to say it would be not normal. It is not normal to say that, unless all Aboriginal people agree we can't progress, if that was the case, we would still have not made any progress at all in anything ever, still waiting for us to agree on, on the first step towards having some sort of equity in this country for ourselves with the rest of the rest of the nation. I think it's an interesting point because we look at even electorates um, and, and voting in a, a member of parliament or local member, you can get in on fifty one percent of the, or you get in on less than fifty one percent of the vote. Um, yep. So, so even that, it's for that electorate, you're not required to have a majority. But somehow, for Indigenous affairs, we, we generally need to be a hundred percent or or nothing. Yeah, it, and it's not simply a majority; it's an absolute, absolute agreement, a universal agreement, one hundred percent. You can't have a single dissenting voice. I'm sorry. Last time I checked, as I said, yeah, North Korea, probably Russia. Um, I don't think we should be thinking to define uh, our people or Aboriginal people as that's the base that they have to work from, yet the rest of Australia can work from the Western democratic model. Um, doesn't really strike me as really where we want to go and how we should operate. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I love it. Uh, I might bring Narelle into the conversation. <laughs> and, and Narelle, tapping into a bit of your experience as a director at the Ethics Centre, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to throw a big question at you straight away, but... Looking at the ethical lens, is this something as simple as saying ethically the right thing to do is to support the voice as an organisation and is it unethical to, to say no? Can it be that simple? <laughs> um, thanks, Phil. I'm, and, um, I'm coming from Wiradjuri land today as um, we've been introduced before, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's not... So I'll just frame my input today, and I'm I'm someone who's come on a, a bit of a journey of understanding about this myself. I've walked on this land for many years and not known a lot about the history, where I grew up, what happened before, and um, and tried to make sense of the world where you know we've got a fundamental inequity uh, at the heart of our country, and trying to understand how what my role is in kind of doing what I can to make that a better place. Um, I've come back to the ethical lens and also importantly, the governance lens. And I mean, if you think um, good governance is is really about good decision making and that's fundamental to the success of any organisation. Now, um, ethics is, is um, big and complicated, but fundamentally that's about what, what constitutes a good decision. In every decision we have, we can we always have a choice. So what's a decision that's going to be aligned with our fundamental and individual and community values? And um, how do we get there? So it's not, from that perspective, um, it's not unethical to not support this or to not, let's start by saying, do I have to have an opinion on this or not? So it's, it's not unethical to um, not, have a, an opinion on this but if you reflect on that that becomes a choice 
so you're making a choice uh, either to not inform yourself or not to participate uh, in in by asking further questions. And then you start to, I, I do anyway, I start to want, want to take that back to how does that align with my own individual values about what I feel is right as well. And I, I think I, in coming on my journey of understanding about this, I've done uh, a lot more reading and where it first started was when I was up at Gama sitting in the dirt uh, where I had to shut up and listen to people and I got so many new perspectives on on our country and then doing a lot more reading and subsequent to that I've gone through the submissions to the Joint Parliamentary Committee that uh, has recently sat on that and there's a lot of lawyers and a lot of po politicians talking uh, and with or giving their views but then I come back to what's a good individual decision by someone and from my perspective I've decided that uh, we're not a whole country until this and uh, a whole and, and prosperous uh, country if we if we're not kind of getting on board this that's my view uh, other people have other views but I feel very strongly it's about good governance and about um, ethical decision making too I think that's interesting it, it's ethics I've never thought it in that lens that <laughs> it, it it almost follows a, a due process like if an organization <laughs> engages their stakeholders engages their staff and executive and board and they might say no, we oppose it or, or we're not going to make a statement, mm -hmm. that that in itself is ethical, not so much the outcome or the, yeah, what they decide to do. Mm. So if you, because if you, if you jump on board, what could be a, a, a fa, you know, a fashion in past, we've had a lot of um, so-called social issues that boards have been and CEOs have been um, pushed to have a view on. Um, now are you doing that for the right reason? Um, yeah. is it because you feel like you're going to get shouted down um, or do you feel saying nothing oh, look it's all too hard I can't possibly get my head around this um, or are you doing it are you doing it for the right reasons and I, I what I've been heartened by in recent months about this is um, not and not everyone's shouting this from the rooftops by the way people are just quietly um, informing themselves and coming to a view and um you, you are seeing that in more uh, institutional participation in this discussion as well. Yeah, that's. Um, I, I think I think that'd be comforting for particularly some of the mm. executives and board members to to hear that because they mm. might feel like you know some of these big companies are coming out and they're being quite vocal mm. and and they feel like they're slow or they're off the mark. But knowing that mm. they're going through the due process, but they're also doing it for the right reasons rather than trying to be first to say yes and, and, and get that kind of public spotlight that seems to come with it at the moment. Um, yeah, yes. I, I think they they yeah. find a bit of comfort in that. And 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 look the 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 fundamental to that the basic um, foundation is uh, as an organization we have purpose mission our, our own organizational values um, and plus each yes. have our own history of in, uh, interaction with society and the country so where do you um, so if you work through a process about how does this align with our with our organizational purpose uh, our mission and how does it align with our values that's a really sound that's a process that organizations go through on a whole range of um, decisions that ma that make they have to make and this I think is a really good um, foundation a framework for that too yeah nice that, that's yeah different mm. perspective that I'd hadn't hadn't really thought about or, or, or appreciated I think um getting Karen's perspective on this and and looking at it from a reconciliation point of view what what role does the voice to parliament play in the future of, of reconciliation and, and you know if it doesn't get up maybe um playing devil, devil's advocate what what would that mean for reconciliation um well i guess um recognition of first nations peoples in our constitution and um having a say in the things that affect and impact our lives have always been part of uh, the reconciliation movement it's certainly always been part of um it was one of the final recommendations of the council for aboriginal reconciliation when we think back in 2000 but more than that um reconciliation is about how do we think about uh the place of First Nations peoples in our uh, in our society in Australia, and how do we put our um, aspirations? Um, how do we put our ways of being and doing and thinking at the centre of what it means to be Australian? So, in that sense, it goes back even further than um, 
Uluru Statement. It goes back further than um, the CAR, um, uh, sorry, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation uh, Movement. It goes back to, you know, the 1930s and the day of mourning when Aboriginal people were saying, we want a say, we want some advocacy. Um, we want to be visible and engaged in this society that we now find ourselves in. And part of the reason for that is we know that when we are and when we get to a say, we come up with the things that are connected to who we are as a people, but also makes sense to who we are as a people. So it's finding our place in this modern Australia. So I guess in that sense, Rick, um, you know, this idea of the voice to parliament, which is just the um, the latest version of or expression of this, has always been part of the reconciliation movement. Um, I am absolutely and continue to be supremely confident that we will get there. Um, part of it is my eternally sunny disposition. But more than that, um, I've been, as we were just saying before uh, we came online, I've been crisscrossing uh, the country this week as part of National Reconciliation Week. And I've seen thousands of Australians, people of goodwill, who are engaged in these conversations. And I think, again, as already been said, what we're really keen is how do we engage people in a respectful conversation around these issues? Um, how do people get informed? Because it is a question that all of us will need to answer uh, once the referendum is put on, or all of us who are citizens and enrolled to vote. Um, and I think the best way that we can honour our generations as our theme for, for Reconciliation Week this year is be a voice for generations. The best way to honour the people of the past and who have fought for justice is to be informed, uh, to be part of the conversations that come next and to get active as, in those conversations. Um, so what does this mean if we don't get up? Well, it will change what reconciliation looks like. I'm not going to lie. It's a bit of an existential question for us. But I think what it will say is that we're not where we thought we are on this journey, um, that we need to do a lot more work. And for all of those 2,300 organisations that have reconciliation action plans and the millions of Australians that work or study in those organisations, so the 10,500 uh, schools and early learning services that are engaged in our Narragunawali Education and Reconciliation Program, um, it means we're going to have to do a lot more work uh, because all of those people are committed and signed up to this idea of a united Australia that respects and values First Nations peoples at the heart of who, it may, uh, who we are as Australians. Um, and if we can't get to a point where we agree on a simple principle that, yes, First Nations people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were the first Australians and that they should be given advocacy uh, within our founding document as Australians, like a lot of other public institutions um, who are created through that document. If we can't get to that simple preposition or proposition rather, then we need to rethink where we are on that journey. But having said that, I am buoyed. By, as I said, the thousands of Australians who are turning up, who are doing walks and at breakfast before the birds are up. Um, and that gives me confidence that we are heading in that right direction. I think that there's two things that you said that were really, really interesting. One's around the day of morning in 1938. So there's, there's part of the narrative that this is the Canberra voice and it's something that a group of leftist Aboriginal people are trying to get up for their own political gain maybe, but it's not new. It's something that we've been campaigning for for a while. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, through every uh, struggle or protest um, around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs, at the heart of it, it's been about self-determination. It's how do we have more agency in our lives when so much of history and so much of um, our institutions have removed that agency. So whether it's our stolen generations, whether it's stolen wages, whether it's uh, not being able to marry the people that you love about where you can and can't live. My grandfather had to have um, a, a licence to be in town after dark. Now, he worked for a non-Indigenous company. He paid taxes, but he wasn't allowed inside the town limits after dark if he didn't have a licence, which was a dog tag. This is not distant history. This is recent past. This is living memory. So... You know, these conversations have been ongoing. I would even argue like right back to the opening of Parliament and also right back to Federation days. Aboriginal voices have been constantly and consistently saying we want to be part of what happens to us. So, yeah, it's a, it's a longer um, conversation. As I said, this is the latest version of that. I think 
on that theme too, you say, you mentioned journey a lot. And I think it's important to frame that, that the voice uh, is the next stage in the journey. I think some people get caught up. I know it happened with the apology a bit, that that was the ultimate end game. They said, oh, they've had the apology. Why, why do we still have these closing the gap issues? But it's another step in the journey. It's not certainly the, um, you know, the the answer and, and everything's going to work out well after that. Great if it did. Um, no, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things we're also saying is while it's Reconciliation Week, really we need to be doing this work every single day and every single week of the year. Um, it doesn't just happen in these kind of commemorative moments. It doesn't just happen in these one-off things. We're unpacking 200 plus years of colonisation and, and subjugation of First Nations peoples within this society. So it's going to take more than sort of just these one things, but these are all building blocks. These are all foundations for how we actually create change and structural change and systemic change. And that's the, the difference um, that we need to be pushing for. Oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's good insights. And um, yeah, biggest thing there is it's not something new. It's not, we haven't just come up with this in 2017. It's um, been around for, yeah, <laughs> plenty of time, long period. Decades. Um, Going to shift back to a, that that high level governance lens and, and what organisations can do, and uh, going to ask Kyle. So I see I see a bit of a divide in some of the organisations where staff might be really supportive of the voice, and and they're thinking, you know, why aren't our executive, why aren't the board coming out and supporting this and making the decision quicker? It seems like a no brainer. You know, we might even have a wrap, but it's it's probably not that simple from that higher level point of view how do boards respond to something like the voice and, and how do you navigate this kind of political minefield yeah thanks phil and i'd like to acknowledge i'm sitting today in uh mula binba territory uh, sometimes known as newcastle and acknowledge the awabical and warimai uh, peoples and look uh that's that's a great question and if you think about and i know narelle you touched on this earlier the role of ethics but if you think about what boards do we employ and manage CEOs, we set strategy, we govern, we comply, uh, we oversee significant budgets. There is a glue that brings all that together and ethics certainly is one of those in the realm, but the purpose values and the culture uh, are essential part of that. And ESG is a very important part of that these days. And if you think about in recent times, you know, dealing look at, at, at rightly so with diversity and the environment, just to pick two, you know, where that journey was of five, 10 years ago, you could argue wasn't very far at all. And it's they've moved some way, not, not um, quick enough and not far enough. Um, and I would put um, First Nations uh, issues and the voice front and centre in the middle of ESG. So a contemporary modern board should be considering um, it amongst its ESG issues um, First Nations issues, and that's why we're here talking today to raise the knowledge in that matter. The reality is boards and executives um, sometimes um, don't align at the same time. So many boards, it begins with the board and then the uh, CEOs and executives follow. Other times it, it's the other way around where it's the executives that are pushing something and then the boards catch up. It really doesn't matter uh, either way because good boards and good executives come to alignment for the right reasons in the end, and that's part of their culture. Um, I've been involved with some very substantial organisations that have been through substantial transformation in short and medium terms. And it and is a journey, the journey word came up earlier. And it's the important thing is to succeed. It's to go on a journey and don't try and rush it so that you're doing too much too quickly where it can unravel. It's, it's moving as fast as possible so that you take everyone on the journey of change. Um, and, and I've really learned a lot about uh, that it's an education process then. And I think that's what today's event is about. It's about education and uh, certainly Ian, you spoke of that earlier, that, um, that education is important. If I could relate to um, one of my boards, Great Southern Bank, you know, we, we have been on that journey where you start with a wrap and, uh, and, and why is that? Because you've got employees that are First Nations, you've got customers that are First Nations background and you've got supplies that are. So it's good for your all of those stakeholders and it's good for... Uh, in fact, the broader community. But of course, there's other levels to, to take it and go to. And more recently, 
the board landed on supporting the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which includes the call for the referendum from, on the voice to parliament. And, and that's that happened only in the last month. But leading up to that was about two or three months of increased knowledge at board level, executive level, that is, you know, right throughout the organisation. And in fact, this week in Reconciliation Week, there's various education sessions going on to inform what the voice is all about, all sides of it, to enable, you know, informed decision making, not to just sometimes to hear all the fiction that's out there, but to actually get the facts. So it's just good business to put uh, this front and centre um, right in the middle of your ESG policies, right in the middle of the organisation as a progressive organisation. Is that sort of a, a mandate you'd, you'd put to directors to kind of educate yourself on this if they seem disengaged is it is it that simple at the board level where you say we need a position on this either way everyone needs to individually engage in some education and then we come back and collectively decide yeah look i i think it is and it and it all starts at the top you know what is the responsibility and culture at the board level and uh and and quite simply if you want to be uh, a purposeful values driven organization that you have to deal with all the contemporary issues, whether you personally know enough about it or not, you have to acquire that knowledge individually and as a collective and go on the journey and really good organizations do that um, with within the board and with their uh, exec team, as I said earlier at, at other times there's the key drivers might come from one way or the other good organization to find that alignment and move quickly. But I do think every director uh, and every uh, organisation uh, should take on board their responsibilities to know more. It's not just about the days are gone where it's just about profit. Um, you know, there's so much you can do in profit for a purpose and employ more people and look after your broader communities. When you get that right, you really uh, have a lot um, better um, values within your organisation. You have high retention um, you have high performance teams and the, the whole community absolutely benefits and the voice is part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think that's interesting. The um, it's almost a process in the organization. Mm -hmm. So regardless, you know, whether it's a voice or uh, you, you're looking at blockchain technology or artificial intelligence, it's, it's a responsibility of those directors to kind of understand and be up to date with that, particularly when it has that impact on your your organization and i might ask ian a question mm -hmm. so what happens when everyone goes out let's say you're the chair of a, a board not not hard for you to pretend um <laughs> educates himself on the voice but then they've got that analysis paralysis where they're like oh they made some really good points at the no campaign but then i think fundamentally it's okay how do you lead a board that's really yep. undecided after that yeah, I think there's just just to take a step back, Phil, and it's good you raised that because there's a couple of things for boards too, and it's picking up on what what Narelle and Kyle both said. The expectation of directors these days, and Kyle, you picked it up exactly, maximising profit and maximum return to shareholders doesn't cut the mustard anymore as a board director. That's not what it's all about, nor is it being compliance. There has been a distinct shift back to what we expect of our uh, corporate sector, our public sector, our not-for-profit sector, what do, you, what do you as an organisation contribute to the society in which you operate? And more importantly, what is society, ex society expecting of you as a good citizen? Um, interesting, the room I'm sitting in, I can, if I turn that way a little bit, I can see the Perth headquarters of Rio Tinto. I'll just leave that <laughs> hanging there. Amazing. Work the rest out for yourself. But that's the thing is that as directors now, you do have to think of more beyond just our daily business and just being compliant. There are greater expectations. And right now, this is a big one for our country. Now, in terms of being a chair, for example, I found one of the things I do as chair, the first thing I want to put forward, I'm not a complex person, right? I'm just a simple bloke. I'm one of the punters. But that helps me, I suppose, cut through things to how you see things for really what they are. And the voice one is an absolute, is, is actually a really good example of that, Phil. Um, I look at the proposed wording. Uh, I look at a lot of the arguments for and against and a lot of the stuff flying around, misinformation, confused information, uh, perhaps not the strategy I'd put together to win a referendum. But essentially, <laughs> what is the question being asked is what you've got to, 
really cut right through too. So I'll just give an example in 67, because we referenced that, that's a starting point. The wording on the the wording on the um, ballot paper was, should the Aborigines be counted in the reckoning of the population, the census, and should the Commonwealth be able to make laws in regard of the Aborigines? That was on the paper, but that wasn't the real question. If you think about the chequered history of Australia in relation to its Aboriginal people, and bear in mind that even up to and including May 1967 and beyond, people were still saying or, or questioning, are the Aborigines a dying race or not? They was, our children were still being stolen before that date, after that date. There was a real question, a deeper question, and it wasn't what was on the paper. The real question Australians had to ask themselves when they went to vote was, do the Aborigines belong in this country? Is there a place for them in the future of this nation? Yes or no? And so as chair for this, I've broken it down for the boards I'm on and for anybody else who cares to listen, what is this really about? Is it about recognition of Aboriginal people in the constitution by establishment of the voice and it'll talk to parliament and executive government and parliament will work out all the mechanics of it, blah, 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 blah. Is that the core question? And it's not. The really fundamental question that Kyle and Narelle and Karen have to ask themselves as board directors, as organisations, but more importantly, as single voters, as Karen mentioned, and ultimately, whatever position we do, we do for a living in, whatever, we ultimately all have to front up on what's increasing look like Saturday, 14 of October, pick up a bit of paper, go into a booth, and have to ask ourselves this question. Should, and I'll use 67 language just to get this clear, should the Aborigines be able to speak? Should we as a country, should I as a voter, allow them to talk about things that are about them? Yes or no? And that's what this is about. You play that out in the boardroom and suddenly it changes. What is the position of our organisation on this? When there is greater expectation on us beyond what our daily practice and what we return to shareholders. We are being measured in other ways. Do we need to think about this? What is our position as a group of people, as a board of directors, should the Aborigines be able to speak or not? And personally, what do I think of that? Should I allow the Aborigines to talk about things that are about them? Key part of being a director and particularly the chair is being able to clear all the, all the fluff away, all the noise, all the smoke, all the mirrors and go to something People will make their own mind up and make their own decision, but at least uh, it won't be in the vacuum of, I don't understand what's at its core. That's what it's at the core of this. That's a, that's a good summary from the average punter, the humble Richmond supporter, is it? <laughs> no such thing as humble at Tiberland, mate. Three, <laughs> three flags in four years. <laughs> uh, beautiful. So I think the next progress of the conversation is, you know, we've navigated that at the the board level and Narelle's got the most, I think, media experience. <laughs> what do we do now if we're supportive of the voice? Do you have to come out and tell the media and do you do it aggressively? Is it worse to say nothing at all or put a throwaway line out? And what happens if you question? What if the media come back and say, well, actually, these are reasons that people oppose it. What do you think personally as a chair of this organisation? How do you how do you navigate that communication piece? Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Phil. Um, I really appreciate the perspectives and, and Ian for just nailing what that fundamental question is. And um, I uh, Simon Longstaff at the Ethics Centre has got a very um, blunt way of putting things, which is, Australia is like a, um, in its current form, is like a um, a car without the windscreen. If you think of it, it's like a car that is missing some fundamental bits, like the windscreen wipers or like the headlights. And um, we just need to make sure that the, the the car is in functional order and actually able to navigate the, in as um, a safe and, and inclusive way in the future. So I just thought I'd, I'd drop that piece. Look, there's an, I'm seeing... Um, and, and talking to a number of organisations about this, if there are a number of different responses. I think you can boil them down into about three groups, right? So you've had a number of sporting organisations uh, made up of the clubs and so forth who've decided to uh, make a big announcement and they've progressively come to kind of articulate 
how that sits with their their values and what they would like to see in Australia's future. There are others who've just quietly um, gone about uh, expressing their support, and you'll hear the uh, they, they didn't make a big announcement, but you see it in their communications uh, on their on their website in their their public and um, and I hesitate. I'd, I'd hasten to say, uh, not a big splash about marketing. It's just quietly, here's how we do things. And and um, I think that's a very, that that's something that sits really well with me. Um, I think it's good to make a, a statement. And then um, I'm hearing less about, um, I've, I'm hearing about some organisations have decided they're not going to come out in support of that. But obviously that doesn't tie their, either their CEO or their um directors or staff from supporting that position mm. so I'd just come back to what what do you think sits with your organizational values and uh, it's this is not about a marketing opportunity it's anything but this is a, actually about um, building a fabric of this country that's going to um, be a full reflection of our potential and it, uh, in, in engaging it in that spirit I think is really fundamental to this it's as Kyle said it, it's the long game is, is that a risk though for an organization saying we're, we're not going to make a statement on this does that does well it... look, yes you'll um you'll cop flack either way these days thanks to yeah. the brilliant kind of Twitter immediate uh, response of social media uh, and that's even more important um, to anchor things in something really firm that that does connect with the fabric of your organisation, and um, be prepared to to stand by that. Um, from that basis, I've there's been a number of directors that um, I've been uh, a growing group, I might um, say, of directors who've, from a governance perspective, are saying this is a really important uh, defining moment for our country, and this is a really uh, this is a way we can actually have a, a fuller expression of our nation, and they've come out in support of that, and we've each come to our own conclusion. But that's a growing group of people who think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I, I kind of have that perception of an organisation like, no, oh, we're not going to make a statement. It, it probably um, undermines the the actual extent that they, um, you know, were true to their organisation and and mm. come to that conclusion. Um, just before we open up to Q and A, I'm going to be cheeky and ask some Karen some questions to mm. Karen. What's the expectation of Reconciliation Australia on this? You said what there's 2,300 wraps that are out, and you've got organisations that have an elevate wrap. Are you expecting anything, particularly from the Elevate ones, are they? Are you expecting them to come out and say, we support this and, and be leaders in this space? Or you, what's your thinking there? Yeah, so our starting point, um, as has already been said by a number of people now, is, is we respect people's right to have an opinion. We encourage people to have an opinion. Um, and whatever the discussion is, it should be uh, a respectful one. Um, no matter where people are starting from or where they they land. Um, what we would say is if an organisation has signed up with a reconciliation action plan, um, basically we're drawing the parallels of the conversations that you might be having about your rap with the conversation that we're having as a nation about a referendum. And one of the fundamental um, parts of having a rap is around the governance piece and, again, a uh, First Nations advisory group, how do you put the wishes, the perspectives, the aspirations of First Nations people into your business? How are you thinking about that through your reconciliation action plan? And so I guess the, the parallel there is for a referendum, how do we as a nation think about putting the aspirations of First Nations peoples into our founding document of the constitution? So that's what we're encouraging uh, organisations with RAPS to do, um, to uh, take that opportunity to educate, but in doing so, talking about, well, the why, as Narelle and, and Ian and Kyle have already said, if an organisation is clear about your why, we ask for a vision statement in a, in a wrap, which is what is your vision for reconciliation in your business? And if you are clear about the why and you then bring your people also, whether it's your board, whether it's your executive, whether it's your employees, your stakeholders, your customer base, if you bring them along with you and you're clear about it, um, again, that's a strength of your position. Um, just doing it because you're jumping on a bandwagon or you feel that your competitors are doing it and if you don't do it, you're mm. you're going to get ahead um, doesn't necessarily help 
the work of reconciliation. It doesn't necessarily help the work of a, a campaign. But being really clear about your why before you do anything is fundamental to anything going forward. Is that um is that across the board regardless of that rap status? Like that that's a new vice for whether it's reflect or or elevate. <laughs> Absolutely. And and it's beyond just, as I said, the referendum. This is about if you are, you've got to answer the question of why. It's got to make business sense to your organisation of why you mm. support reconciliation and have a wrap um, because of the things that people end up doing. You know, it, it requires um, a lot of organisations to rethink the way that they do business in some cases. Um, and that's no easy feat. So being clear about your why becomes really important because it's your light on the hill to borrow from um, some political speak, um, but it also makes sure that you're really clear about where you're headed. Is it <laughs> what what happens if an organisation it was they said they're they're going to be a no vote or and they've got an elevate rap? Does that or, or they're not going to really get that involved with it? Does, does that negate some of the things that they've done as an organisation? based on this can you can you sit with that can you have an elevate rap and someone say i'm not really going to get involved or we're leaning towards not supporting it so we would never <laughs> hold uh an organization's um type of rap or the approval or endorsement of their rap uh against uh, a single business decision like that but I guess it comes back to some of the fundamentals that sit behind and underneath and within the wrap itself. So going back to the vision, going back to the intention, uh, going back to what else are you doing and inputting. And um, often that's where we start to find there might be gaps um, in either understanding, um, perhaps in the way that things are being interpreted. Um, and so it's pointing to a, a bigger or broader fundamental kind of um, gap knowledge. And so that's when we would work with an organisation to understand, well, where actually are you on that journey? We thought you might have been here, but maybe you're here. Um, but it's not going to be beholden on whether an organisation comes out and says yes or no. Uh, fundamentally, that's up to organisations themselves. And ultimately, it's about individuals um, that have to, to write yes or no, rather than the organisation itself. But again, as been pointed out, many organisations feel that social responsibility uh, to build a better country, to better build a better society. And as the Solicitor General has said, this idea of voice is actually something that will enhance our system of governance and democracy in this country. I think that's good hearing that from you because there's, there's some of the murmurs in organisations around that, uh, having a reconciliation action plan and, and, yeah, what their position on the voice is. And if they're quiet on this, do they lose some of that? Um, I guess reputation or, or quality work that they've done before. So I think that's um, that's really important to to kind of cover that off because you know, people create weird different scenarios and, and stuff in their mind. Uh, well, I'm going to invite people throwing uh, in some questions. Sorry, I, cut I was off. just going to say. I mean, this was also the deliberateness in while we're sort of toying with the idea of voice in our theme for National Reconciliation Week, um, it's not just all about the voice. This is a, the broader notion of having a say. Um, it's a, a broader notion of being an advocate for change and how um, anyone, if they're in this reconciliation sphere, can have a, a say, can do change and do good. So um, it is broader than just the voice, although, as I've already said, it's the voice says the big V um, is fundamental to some of that work sort of happening. All right, we're going to flip to the Q and A part now. Uh, going to invite uh, people to start typing in the chat. Any any questions that you've um, had, or anything you've heard, any myths, any, any anything in the media, any uh, clarification around the process? Uh, if you're on a board or an executive and you, you want to tap into some of the expertise here, uh, the the first one that I have is uh, one thing I hear is the voice proposal is extra bureaucracy. How's that going to bridge those terrible mortality, health, and economic disadvantages? How will it? make a difference practically. I think um, maybe, Ian, this, this might be in your sphere. Will, will it just create yep. more red tape to the point where it's nothing after, happens? After 32 years in government, yes, it's a little bit in my belly wick. Um, <laughs> okay, so that thing of, an, I think that thing of bureaucracy is a bit of a red herring. The assumption that it will create huge amounts of bureaucracy is not correct because you. this isn't about having a big bureaucracy. This is about what is the best effective, efficient mechanism, assuming it gets passed. So let's be clear about that. The first hurdle we have to clear is that this is a yes vote. If it's a no vote, 
then bureaucracy, detail, money, all of that, none of it matters. We won't even talk about it. So assuming it's a yes vote, then we talk about the mechanism. And the mechanism is, of course, you'll need a bureaucracy. You'll need some sort of administrative machine to make it work. But you look to make it the most effective and efficient one that there is. And simply assuming bureaucracy is a bad thing. And I think, actually, there's, an, oh, there's another building I can see at my window, PWC, which goes to the whole thing of not having a bureaucracy and see where that's got us in relation to tax reform. I think bureaucracy in and of itself is a good thing. It's a necessary thing. It's how a robust democracy functions. It's the machinery of government. But the assumption that this will be a Canberra-centric, big, overcost, and expensive bureaucracy is a complete red herring. So that that isn't a thing that people should worry about. The second part of how will it make a difference to all those gaps and all that. One of the things that we don't do in Aboriginal affairs and why we're arguing for this now is hearing from the ordinary punters, hearing from ordinary Aboriginal people. We have our Aboriginal peak bodies who talk about what they do. So Nacho talks about health and, and Nails talks about legal stuff and quite rightly, and they should and they do and they focus on it, but they view the world through their particular lens and it's often framed around what's wrong. The fundamental issue though is there's a lot they don't pick up and it's not their job to pick it up. This is something which which drives me insane is people just talk about what's wrong with being Aboriginal, what's bad about being Aboriginal, as if all we are is a series of disconnected, disjointed problems that need fixing, closing gaps. That is not who we are. We They are characteristics of some of us, but that is not who we are as a people. What the voice will be, if it operates as it should, is redefining us, is asking ordinary Aboriginal people, not our leaders, and that gets chucked around a lot, I think. You know, anybody who gets their mug on the telly is now a leader or in parliament is a leader. So I think we need to be careful about that. But ordinary Aboriginal people, the, the voice can and should do and it will be built around is giving, is giving the chance for ordinary Aboriginal people to speak about their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations and their ideals, not just what's wrong and how do we close the gap. If it was just that, I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't bother with it. This has to be much more, much, much more than the immediate thing of fixing problems. Because I can tell you from being in government for 30 plus years, fixing problems is easy. It's comfortable, it's easy, and it's lazy. You just got to want to do it. And in my own state, Victoria, yeah. we've moved on from that. I think we have to think about the voice being so much more than just the closing of gaps. It's about giving Aboriginal people the opportunity to say, here's what we bring to the nation. Here's what we contribute to it. Here's where we want to be as part of this country going forward. And Commonwealth Government, here's the part you play in helping us fulfil that that ideal. Beautiful. Sorry, Thanks. don't do short answers. Thanks, Ian. Uh... <laughs> Uh, the red Bill, tape can I just the, uh, um, question. Yeah, yeah. echo that? And I, I, this is a, a point we made the other day. I think that's the flip side of this is there's so much for us to gain as a nation. Um, are we pretending that our Western democratic approach to decision-making and governance and uh, so forth is so perfect? Um, it, it's not that perfect, right? It's the best imperfect approach. And there's so much that we there's so much potential there for us to um, to learn and and grow as a nation through learning this um, deep connection with land and with um, kind of soul and so forth. Uh, I think that's a, an element that the lawyers and the politicians struggle with with that as well. But I think that's a really powerful um, persuasion as well. Yeah, there's certainly what sixty thousand years of governance and economics on one of the driest continents in, in the world to, to learn from. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's a good point in that we certainly don't have a perfect system. And I think Ian alluded to, I can't remember the exact phrase, but some of the, the people that are in our parliament at the moment and, and how that's kind of happened when you've had 2% of the total vote. Um, so that that's certainly an interesting perspective. I think this next question might suit Kyle best. It says, as an organisation looking to come out with a public statement soon and wanting to look after our large employee base, what are some good examples of how to prepare and support people in an organisation uh, that is face to face with uh, potentially some of the racism every day? So we, we assume you come out and support and said yes, but how do you kind of look after your staff that might 
yeah, come come face to face with that on a daily basis? It's a great, great question, Phil. The, the reality is there will be conflict. Um, you know, and if you think organisations have major policy change every year, some very frequently, this is just would be another policy. And uh, what you don't do is not prepare for uh, all the scenarios. You really got to educate. Um, you've got to get the um, wording right. And Narell, people like Narell, the professionals and others, uh, having your internal capability and, and or partnering with external experts to get the wordsmithing right is crucial. So, and, and I like simple messages, what this is and what it isn't uh, and what the benefit is to all. You know, simplify it so that it's not just, you know, a lot of words that don't really mean a lot. But the main game is, uh, the, answering the question is, uh, really spending time well before the information goes out to your customers uh, on uh, supporting your staff with the knowledge and also how to deal with conflict. So there are, you know, conflict resolution and, uh, and teaching them how to react is crucial and then supporting them through tough times. So having policies and management capability to um, weave through change like that is crucial and uh, many professional organisations can go through some really um, tough policy changes very successfully. And, and the whole objective here is you, you've just got to understand you're not going to please everybody, but you want to retain your employee capability in that culture. And you want to retain as many of your clients and customers as you can and your suppliers. And there's a way to communicate and educate and manage through that if done the right way. Yeah, yeah, I think it finds a bit of comfort because we see. Um, I think they just announced in the budget too for um, First Nations people of some mental health support uh, around this, and and that'll certainly go into the bigger employer groups. I think we've got time for one more question, and we might finish with uh, Karen. I think might be the best, hopefully, the best to answer this, and it, it's a common one we get and hear in the media. Uh, we talk about First Nations people having a voice, but how are people in remote communities being heard? I think if we can play on that topic because there's a perception by. Uh, certain people in media that, again, this is a Canberra voice and is it actually including the, the followers in remote communities? Well, I'd say that um, Aboriginal people live both in remote, regional and urban centres. So um, if we're talking about being representative of First Nations people, it's representative of all of those different scenarios of where we live. Um, while the first step really is to say, yes, this is something we believe should exist, the second step once we're passed or through a referendum is to then say, well, what does that look like and what does the makeup? And already the indications are that there will be specific um, uh, places and spaces held for remote areas because we know um, whether you're First Nations or, or not, if you live in remote areas, there are particular challenges of um, geography that inf uh, impacts and affects um, uh, the way that you live and how you live. So, you know, those, those questions will be picked up in the second phase. Um, and the most important thing is, a, again, a commitment that this will be done uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So again, the people that are going to be most affected by this will be part of designing the solutions for, for how that um, voice and, and what it looks like. Yeah, and I, I, that's that's a good off the the top that you said that I, th I think the stats are like eighty percent of us live in kind of urban regional areas and it's twenty percent in remote. Remote just tends to get a lot of the kind of focus, regardless. But I, I guess even my sense check, uh, I was out at Yarraba a few weeks, community up in Cairns. I don't know if that counts as remote, but a bit isolated. Uh, but you know they're they're wanting this, they're they're supportive of this as well. So just a sense check out in community in some of those remote areas is they're quite uh, quite interested. It's probably just. Um, yeah, some of the, the NOPE campaign that's uh, yeah, getting in the way of that. So we've hit our uh, two thirty mark. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you everyone for uh, jumping in and um, uh, listening to the event. Hopefully you got some value and, and a bit more clarity um, around the voice to parliament um, without any real uh, political um, focus on on any agenda either way. Uh, tried to bring an impartial discussion around the the conversation, and uh, yeah, that word clarity I think has been the main focus. If we've provided that, uh, we'll have a recording of the training that people will be able to access. We've got everyone's email address, um, so you'd be able to jump on and rewatch this. It's a, it's a complex topic, so don't expect everyone to pick it up from start to finish. So you might want to watch it a few times and uh, get a bit of clarification around some of those things. And uh, thank you, Kyle, Ian, Karen, and Narelle for jumping on this uh, important conversation. Very, very much appreciate it. Thanks, Phil.
Thanks for having us. Thanks, no problem. everybody. Thanks, Thanks for having us, well. Phil. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.